All right, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to grab them and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Last week we began this new series, Jesus On, and we're calling it subtitled, The Only Perspective That Matters. And today's message is going to cover an important topic that I think all of us can relate to and deal with in some form or fashion. We're looking at, this is the title of the message today, Jesus On Anxiety. In 1988, a 38-year-old son of a Baptist minister wrote a song that climbed to the top of the pop charts. It won Song of the Year. It won Album of the Year. It's the only a cappella song to ever shoot to number one on the Billboard Top 100 chart. Do you know what song I'm talking about? I'm going to sing it for you a little bit, and when I do... You're going to be singing it the rest of the day. You ready? Here's a little song I wrote. Nope, or don't worry. Be happy. All right, now if you were to continue singing that song, I love that lyric. In every life we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. So don't worry, be happy. If it was only that easy, right? Don't worry, be happy. If we could, in the words of Timon and Pumbaa from the Lion King, Akuna Matata, it means no worries for the rest of your days. If we could just embrace this philosophy, if we could just say it out loud and really believe it with all of our heart, then everything would be okay. If it was only that easy. The reality is all of us have anxieties, we have worries, we have concerns in life that weigh us down, and if we're not careful, they can prevent us from moving forward spiritually, they can threaten to overwhelm us emotionally, cripple us mentally, and sometimes even do physiological harm to us. The word worry that we're going to see in this passage of scripture comes from a a word that means to choke or to strangle. Some of your Bibles translate this word as anxious, which means to divide or to rip apart, to pull in separate directions. I don't want you to answer this out loud, but I mean, truly, does this describe some of you, the way that you feel? I mean, right now, the situation that you're in on the inside, you feel like it's, it's pulling you apart. That circumstance that you're facing It feels like it's choking the life out of you. Well, if so, let's look at what Jesus has to say. Because he says a lot in his very first sermon about worries and anxieties and how we're to deal with them. Now, we're going to read this passage, but let me just say as we get there, Matthew chapter 6, if you've never thought the Bible was relevant, or that Jesus was relevant. Maybe uh, Easter was your first week in church in a long time and you heard we're going to be teaching on this subject and you came back uh, today to hear this and we're really glad uh, that you're here. But uh, sometimes the whole thought is I've never read the Bible because it's just so outdated. Uh, you know, what, is, what does Jesus have to say to me now? Well, one of the reasons that we're doing this Jesus on series is because what Jesus talks about is relevant. And he speaks on diff- just about every issue we'll, we'll deal with and, and go through in life. The Bible's extremely relevant, it's extraordinarily helpful, and it's very practically, and we're going to see this in this series. Now, Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, let's see what Jesus had to say about dealing with worry and anxiety. He says this, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, 
Do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble." Jesus is speaking to a group of people there on the Sermon on the Mount. The mass majority of them are poor. They're not knowing where their next meal is going to come from. And four times in this passage of Scripture, Jesus tells these people, do not be anxious. Now, I'd say that is a pretty bold command. If I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from, And as you can see, that is not the case in dealing with me. But if it were, I don't know that I would appreciate a traveling preacher telling me not to worry about it, not be anxious about it. It doesn't sound that helpful to me. In fact, it sounds like Jesus is minimizing what I'm struggling with and what I'm going through. On first hearing, it sounds like a first century version of don't worry, be happy. Hakuna Matata. No worries. But as is always the case with Jesus, he doesn't just tell us what to do or what not to do and leave it there. Instead, like any good teacher that cares for us, he explains himself and he provides us with some information that will help us do or not do whatever it is he's saying or teaching about. Now in this teaching, Jesus is going to give three reasons that we shouldn't worry or let anxiety overwhelm and overrun our life. I'm going to add a fourth reason to it that Jesus doesn't speak to explicitly, but after we talk about it, you'll say, of course, Jesus knew about that, aware about that and he does speak to it indirectly so let's look at it four reasons why worry and anxiety shouldn't be a part of our life number one is it's unreasonable this is what Jesus says look it doesn't make sense to worry now again the ESV translates this word that translates this word as anxious the NIV translates it as worry are these the same things Uh, we 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 would say they're incredibly close Uh, Some have said that anxiety is prolonged worry. But for what we're talking about today, we're going to use these words as interchangeable. And one of the first points that Jesus makes is that to worry or to be anxious is not reasonable. And he, he tells us why. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you of no more value than they? Verse 28 through 30. Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus is encouraging his listeners who are facing anxieties and having concerns and worried about stuff in life to step back and to just think for a moment. Isn't it true That the first thing that happens when a circumstance or a situation arises that causes us anxiety, that provokes worry in our life, isn't this true? One of the first things that we lose when a situation that seems out of control comes into our life, the first thing we lose, isn't it true, is our mind. I mean, we throw all logic out the door. We stop thinking straight. And what happens is we get tunnel vision and all we can see is the mountain in front of us. All we can see is the situation that is causing us trouble. And it's in times like these that if we're not careful, what happens is our mind wonders and what do we do? Tell me if it isn't true. We go to worst case scenario, don't we? We start down the what if trail. What if this and what if that? And the more we fixate, on what may or may not be true, what may or may not even be happening, the more worrying we do and the greater the intensity of our anxiety. Have you ever heard of the worry cycle? 
Linda Mental is a PhD. She wrote a book called Letting Go of Worry, God's Plan for Finding Peace and Contentment. And she talks about this worry cycle that all of us are prone to. And it's this just downward spiral when we let worry and anxiety get the best of us. It's an illustration of how we lose our minds. She writes this, your family plans a trip to the beach, but you hear on the news that a shark has been sighted near your destination. So the worry cycle starts. Your mind wonders, if a shark has been sighted, there must be more than one. If there's more than one shark, the odds are we will see one while we're at the beach. If we don't see a shark, how many more are there that we cannot see? If there are sharks we cannot see, then we can't be safe in the water. If we're not safe in the water, we'll get too hot on the sand. If we're too hot on the sand, we could suffer a heat stroke. If we could suffer a heat stroke on the beach, we should probably just stay in our room. If we're gonna stay in our room, what's the point of going to the beach? Maybe we should just stay home and then we don't have to worry about a plane crash, a car wreck, the airlines losing our luggage, our identities being stolen, getting food poisoning, and we especially don't have to worry about getting eaten by a shark. Do you see what happens when the worry cycle begins? We fall prey to this and we allow our minds to spin out of control and they go to worst case scenario and it locks us up. And if we take a step back and really think about what we're saying to ourselves, we'll see how faulty our thinking is, how unreasonable our worry may be. This is what Jesus is trying to get his listeners to understand. He says, look at the birds of the air. They get fed. I mean, come on, are you as God's prized creation made in the image of God not more important than birds? Look at the fields, uh, the grass of the fields. God clothes them with these beautiful flowers. How illogical is it to think that God's not gonna provide for your basic needs? And by the way, just that crowd being there that day, just, just them being there, being present, taking in oxygen, listening to Jesus pr uh, preach, that's proof that he's, he's gotten up to this point. Certainly he can continue. He might not have taken care of all of their wants, but he's taking care of all of their needs. And Jesus, in giving this object lesson of the birds of the air and the grass of the fields, he's just trying to point to them that worry is unreasonable. Secondly, it's unproductive. Look at verse 27. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And of course, this is a rhetorical question. The answer is nobody. You might have a footnote that translates another phrase attributed to Jesus. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his stature. Worrying doesn't add to life, it takes away. I read this week, just in preparing for this message, a study done by Cornell University. They followed a group of people around for an extended amount of time, and here's what they found. 85% of, of the people that, uh, of what they were studying, 85% of what the people they were studying worried about never happened. And the 15% that were worried about something that did happen, 79% of that 15% said that what happened to them didn't turn out as bad as they thought it was going to be, and that they were pretty proud of themselves because they handled the situation better than they thought they would. So you put those numbers together, 97% of the time, the things we are worrying about are nothing. One commentator looking at this Research, he was a surgeon, an MD. Uh, Dr. Charles Black, listen to what he says. Let me reiterate, 97% of the things we worry about either never happen or we handle them, possibly learn something valuable in the process. Only 3% of the time did people's worries prove well-founded. Only 3%. He said, I get better returns on my stock market investments than I get on my worries. And one of those worries is ironically, the stock market. It was Mark Twain who said, I am an old man and have known a great many troubles, but most of them have never happened. Worry is unreasonable. Doesn't make sense to worry when you step back 
and think about who God is in our life. It's unproductive. Someone said, worries like a rocking chair. It keeps you busy, but you don't go anywhere. <laughs> Mass majority of that which we worry about and that causes anxiety, we can't do a single thing about. So it's unreasonable, it's unproductive. Third, it's unhealthy. Now, this is one that Jesus did not explicitly say, but I do think it's one of the reasons he says, do not be anxious. He knows it's not good for us. I mean, he created us. Do you know 38% of all deaths are heart-related, and many of these are brought on by hypertension, high blood pressure due to overwhelming anxiety and stress? The National Alliance on Mental Illness, their records, there are over 40 million adults in the U.S., have an anxiety disorder. That's 19% of our population. Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist professor at New York University. He wrote a book called The Coddling of the American Mind, and he's written a follow-up to it called The Anxious Generation, how the great rewiring of childhood is causing an epidemic of mental illness. I haven't read the book in full, but I read some interviews that he's done, and I saw some information and graphs that he put in the book. I want to show you this one graph right here. This is from a national survey on drug use and health that Height uses. And as you can see, uh, the percentage of U.S. anxiety prevalence has risen sharply since 2010. And you can see it in ages 18 to 25-year-olds, 139% increase since 2010. Now, Height's hypothesis is this, is that in 2010, that is when the youngest generation, those who are now 18 to 25 really got on their, their smartphones. That's when social media started. Uh, that's when access to the internet was right there at their fingertips. They've had it since they were little children. And, and what he goes on to say is, as a result of that, kids weren't going outside and playing as much. They weren't taking risks. They weren't getting their elbow skin up because they were inside scrolling on their phones, on their tablets. And as a result, they've grown up into young adults who haven't had, uh, 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 they don't have coping uh, skills. They don't have relational coping mechanisms to help them deal with stress. And so as a result, this is what he said, the loss of human happiness, flourishing, and productivity for mental health is staggering. He said, we've known, for a long, we've known this for a long time. So what's going to happen is this anxious generation, I don't know how much they will get over it. We don't know yet. But presumably, if their minds are set more towards defend mode than discover mode, they do seem to be more anxious in their 20s as well. So I'm not saying, you know, that it's locked in, that you can't change. But I think we're going to see this generation more anxious and depressed for the rest of their lives on average. And he gives some great advice to parents, some healthy boundaries on what we should be doing with the phones, at age we should be introducing phones. And I think as Christians, we need to lead the way in this because there's incredible peer pressure out there. Get our phone by the time they're this age. And what his social science work is showing is that it's doing some damage that we may not understand for years to come. You can look up worry on WebMD. I don't encourage you to look up anything on WebMD. <laughs> I was looking through there. I came up with all sorts of symptoms I didn't know I had. <laughs> but listen to what it says. Chronic worrying can affect your daily life so much that it may interfere with your appetite, lifestyle habits, relationships, sleep, and job performance. Many people who worry excessively are so anxiety-ridden that they seek relief in harmful lifestyle habits such as overeating, cigarette smoking, or using alcohol and drugs. We know this is true. According to the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry in an article entitled The Economic Burden of Anxiety Disorders, it states that anxiety disorders cost the U.S. more than $42 billion a year, almost one-third of the country's $148 billion total health bill. And listen, I want to highlight at this moment in the message that there are some, the very best thing you can do for your anxiety is talk to your physician, Talk to a professional counselor about it. I'm not knocking in any way medicines or antidepressants. It could be that there are some biological factors that play into your life. And a psychiatrist, a doctor, medicine could be God's agents of grace in your life to help you deal with the severe anxiety that you may be facing. The point I'm making is worry is not healthy. 
We know this. Jesus who created us knows this. And it's why he commands us in the first place. Don't be anxious. He has our best interests at heart. So we've seen worry is unreasonable. It's unproductive. It's unhealthy. A fourth reason Jesus gives is it's unchristian. Uh Uh-oh. I said it. Now notice I did not say if you worry, you're not a Christian. I didn't say that. I said worrying and anxiety in and of itself is unchristian. How can you say that, pastor? Because Jesus said it. Look at verse 31 and 32. Therefore, do not be anxious. And it's written in the tense, stop doing what's already in progress. He knows us. He knows we're prone to worry, prone to anxiety. He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Look at verse 32. For the Gentiles seek after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. By saying Gentiles, what Jesus is saying is, this is what the world does. It's the world. Those who are not in a relationship with God, they're the ones that worry. Not followers of Yahweh. Not those who are in a relationship with the Lord who created the heavens and the earth, spoke everything into existence when nothing was yet created. Why on earth would followers of the Lord worry? You've got God in your corner. So let's answer the question once and for all, is worrying a sin? Well, yes and no. Listen, we are to be responsible and we're to tackle issues and problems in life head on as Christians. There will be stresses and stressors in life. Look, we don't check our mind at the door when we walk in here. We're not oblivious to pain. We're not immune to tough times and to trials. As Christians, people we love get sick and die. Our finances get tight. We have relationship issues and struggles. We have jobs that can seem to overwhelm us at times and be too much to handle. There will be, we will have causes for concern in life that grip us. What Jesus calls for here is that as his followers, we should never get to a point while we will have causes of concern, those causes of concern should not have us. While they grip us, it should not cause us to lose grip on our faith and to lose a grip on God. That's when worry and anxiety becomes a sin. Notice the words of Jesus. Notice the words of Jesus, second part of verse 30. Oh, you of little faith. You want to know why worry and anxiety is so dangerous for the Christian? Because it's in the same bloodline as unbelief. Because essentially that's what we're doing. We're doubting what God can do. Doubting that God is there. Matthew 13, Jesus could not do many miracles in his own hometown, the Bible says, because of their unbelief. That's why worry and anxiety is so dangerous. It shares a bloodline with unbelief. It's interesting. I did a little study this week on that phrase, oh, you of little faith. That word little there, it can be translated as lack. It's not that there's no faith present. It's just that there's a lack of faith present. And when you hear Jesus say this, and he says it on a number of occasions, oh, you of little faith, don't hear this harsh rebuke, like disgust, my goodness. Can't believe y'all are out there not believing me, not trusting in me. That's not the, that's not the tone or the posture that Jesus has taken here. What you need to see and think about when you see this phrase, oh, you of little faith, it's more of a putting the arm around, coaching you up. Oh, you have a little faith. Come on. I liken it to football coaches I had growing up. I'd have one coach. I'd mess up. He'd grab me by the face mask. Stevens! Just scared me to death, you know. Dog cuss me. Get back out there. All right? That wasn't helpful, okay? I'd have another coach, Stevens, get over here. Put his arm around me. Hey, you're better than that. And when this happens, this is what you need to see. This is what you need to do. Go out there and make the play. I can handle that. 
That's what Jesus is saying here in O oh, you of little faith. Check this. Five times in Matthew's gospel, it's recorded that he spoke these words. O oh, you of little faith. He did it in chapter 6 right here where there's a lack of faith. There's a lack of trust that God, you're going to provide and meet my basic needs. Okay? And this is important. In every situation we're going to see, there's this physical element present. In Matthew chapter 8, this is when Jesus is in the, the, the boat with the disciples. Now look, he told the disciples, get in this boat. We're going to go to the other side. If Jesus tells you you're going to go to the other side, you're going to get to the other side. And they're in this boat, Matthew chapter 8, and a storm comes up on the Sea of Galilee, and that, it starts white capping, man. That boat is rocking, and the disciples talk about losing their mind, unreasonable worry. They, they, wait, they, they have to wake Jesus up, okay? So notice this. What's rocking their world has rocked Jesus to sleep, all right? And they wake him up. They've lost their mind. Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Went to worst-case scenario. Jesus gets up, he rebukes the wind and the waves. It starts with a great storm, it ends with a great calm. What's in the middle? Jesus speaking over the situation, peace be still. And he says, oh, you of little faith. We read it again in Matthew chapter 15. Peter's walking out on the water. You remember that story, right? He gets out of the boat, he's walking on water. As long as he's looking at Jesus. But what happens? He starts looking at the wind and waves. He looks at the physical, loses sight of the spiritual, and he starts drowning. And what does Jesus do? The Bible, he, P- P- Peter cries out, save me. And the Bible says immediately Jesus reached down and saved him. Immediately put his arm around him. Oh, you a little faith. And then they walk back to the boat together. You can read about a conversation that takes place with the disciples in Matthew 16. And it's regarding the disciples' mind being on the temporal. Again, the physical rather than the spiritual. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. He does it again in Matthew chapter 17 when the disciples can't cast a demon out of a a person. They come to Jesus and say, why couldn't couldn't we do it? And he says, because you have little little faith. They were doubting the power of God. In every instance where Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, there is a correlation between a lack of trust in who God is in what God can do and in every situation watch this they are concentrating on the physical over the spiritual there's a lesson here as Christians we do not walk by sight 2 Corinthians 5 7 but we walk by faith we can't simply be influenced by our five senses what we can see and touch and heal and feel that will only when we're when we're concentrating on the physical what's happening around us That will only increase worry and decrease faith. Listen to what pastor and author A.W. Tozer wrote in his book, The Pursuit of God, about this world of sense. He says, the world of sense intrudes upon our attention day and night for the whole of our lifetime. It's clamorous, insistent, and self-demonstrating. It does not appeal to our faith. It is here, assaulting our five senses, demanding to be accepted as real and final. But sin has so clouded the lenses of our hearts that we cannot see the other reality, the city of God shining around us. The world of sense triumphs. The visible becomes the enemy of the invisible, the temporal of the eternal. That is the curse inherited by every member of Adam's tragic race. At the root of the Christian life lies belief in the invisible. The object of the Christian's faith is unseen reality. Listen, worry increases and faith decreases. The moment We put our eyes and mind and heart on the physical over the spiritual. The opposite is also true though. When we put our mind and eyes and heart on the spiritual over the physical, what happens is our worry decreases and our faith increases. Where there are six times in Matthew's gospel, oh, you of little faith, there are two times in Matthew's gospel where Jesus comes into contact with people who demonstrate such great faith, it blows him away. One is a Roman centurion comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I have a servant that's sick. Will you please heal him? He's on his deathbed. And Jesus said, sure, let's go to your house. And the Roman centurion says, you don't have to go to my house. I'm a man under authority. I get this. You just say the word and he'll be healed. Jesus in this conversation, listen to it. Matthew chapter eight, verse 10. When he heard this, look at what the Bible says. He marveled. This man's faith marveled Jesus. And those, he said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. A second time, a pagan Canaanite woman. 
Jesus is having dinner with his disciples and a pagan Canaanite woman comes in and falls at his feet and worships him and begs him. She has a daughter who is demon possessed and she's hurting herself when, when that d- demon would get a hold of her and can, can convulse her. She would, she would hurt herself and she begs Jesus to please cast the demon out to make her daughter well. And you read their exchange, it's a beautiful exchange. And after this, t- this conversation, Matthew chapter 15, verse 28, Jesus answered, oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. I want you to notice the irony in this. Notice the irony in this. In every instant, oh you of little faith, who is Jesus talking to? The disciples or Jewish people? Those who are in a relationship with Yahweh. And they have little faith. In the two instances where he marvels at faith, it's a Roman centurion and a pagan Canaanite woman. Two Gentiles. Shame on us, church, if the outside world has greater faith in our God than we do. That's what's being taught here. Secondly, notice the difference. Notice the difference between small faith people who are focused on the physical and great faith people who are focused on the spiritual. The small faith people focused on physical, and and, and those are legitimate concerns. The disciples thought they were dying. The people didn't know if they were going to eat. Peter thought he was going to drown. Legitimate concerns. But they thought that their concerns were bigger than the object of their faith, God. They thought their physical worries and anxieties were bigger than than God. To those who had great faith, they had the same physical hurdles. I mean, a Roman centurion servant is dying. A young lady's daughter is filled with demons. That's a great physical barrier that would cause amazing stress and worry and anxiety. But the big faith people didn't let what was physical, cloud their vision of the spiritual. And so how do we get to a point where we are not letting that which is physical that could cause worries and anxieties and concerns and again, legitimate things that we're all facing, but how do we get to a point where we don't let that which is physical be bigger than that which is spiritual? Because when we do this, when we see God for who he is, that's when Worry decreases and faith increases. What do we do? How do we get there? How do we make sure our spiritual senses are sharpened? One word, one word. Are you ready for it? Pray. Pray. You're saying, are you kidding me? That's it? That's a kuna matata. I mean, pray? I'm telling you, I don't know how else you can minimize or eliminate worry in your life if you don't pray. This is what God has given us. Access to him. Prayer is what focuses us. We take our worries to the Lord and we turn our worries into prayer. And as we do, worries will decrease and faith will increase. Prayer is what puts our worries and our struggles and our stresses in their proper place and in their proper perspective. And this is not simplistic Christianese language and advice I'm giving you. I'm telling you, prayer is the only thing that will do it. We're talking about what Jesus says in this series. Let me just bring what the Apostle Paul said regarding anxiety and prayer. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You go back to Matthew chapter 8. What was the difference between the great storm and the great calm? The disciples crying out to Jesus. They were praying. Max Lucado said, worry is the interest we pay 
on the prayerless life. He's right. So what does it mean to pray? I mean to to turn your worries into prayer requests. To see the spiritual over the physical. Number one, it means you pursue the Lord and his will. That's what prayer is. It's pursuing God and it's pursuing his will. Matthew 6, verse 33. This is in the passage dealing with worry and anxiety. What does Jesus say? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. When we seek God and we pursue him, we grow in our knowledge of who he is, what he can do. And so when something happens in our life, we're walking in a vibrant relationship with the Lord. We know who's got our back. We know who's on our side. Jesus says twice in this passage of Scripture, verse 26 and verse 32, your heavenly Father, if you study the Sermon on the Mount, 17 times in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses these words, your heavenly Father. Father. It was revolutionary to the people of that day. They didn't see God as Father. They saw him as a distant deity who didn't care about what was going on in their life. God had way bigger things to take care of than them. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, no, no, no. The God that created the heavens and the earth, he is a father to you. And what do fathers do? They look after and they provide for and they protect. Some of you might not have had a good earthly father. I had a great earthly father. My dad's here today, my hero. I love him. Grateful for his influence and example in my life. But as great as he is, and he's one of the best, he's one of the goats. As great as he is, he doesn't compare to my heavenly father. How can I worry when dad's got it under control? I remember when I was teaching my little girls how to swim. I would be in the water. Jump on in. And they're just pacing up and down the side of that pool. They won't jump in. And it's so frustrating to me. Because not once... Have I led them astray? Not once have they jumped into my arms and I just turned the other way and let them fall. Never. I want them to know how much fun it is, man. Come on in. You can trust me. Jump into my arms. Watch this. Let me prove it to you. As I've proved it over and over and over again. Finally, they jump in and they see just how much fun it is. They want to do it again. Sometimes I think that's how God looks at us. He's he's looking at us. He's got these open arms and we're just pacing up and down the pool. That's what he means. Oh, you of little faith. Come on, have I ever dropped you? How can you forget? I've got the whole world in my hands. When we pray and we pursue God and his will, it reinforces us to help us see that we have a heavenly father who is large and in charge and he cares for us. Think about what causes us anxiety and stress. It's the unknowns. It's the uncertainties. But what is unknown and uncertain to us is not uncertain to God. He sees it and he cares and he loves you and he has your back A, or R, let's go to R. Remember what the Lord has done. Hey, past faithfulness fuels future faith. Past faithfulness fuels future faith. This is why I encourage you to journal. Get an open Bible, read it, study it, and have your prayer request in there, and you journal what God's doing in your life so that you can recall the faithfulness of God. This is what Jesus is doing. Look at the birds. He wants them to remember, God will take care of the birds. He'll take care of you. Look at the grass in the field. God will clothe the grass. He's going to take care of you. Pray with open eyes. Prayer's not always bowing your head and closing your eyes. I encourage you to take walks and pray and ask God to show you the spiritual through the physical. That's what Jesus did. He was showing them the spiritual through the physical birds. See, if not, if we're not prayerfully walking with a posture of prayer, looking at the the physical through the spiritual, what we'll see is just the physical will overwhelm us. And what will happen? Worry increases, faith decreases. But if we pray with a posture of saying, God, show me what you want me to say, what we start seeing is God starts showing us something, and we'll see storm clouds roll in. And we're looking at it with a prayerful posture because it'll storm. But you know what happens inevitably? We see it all the time here in Houston. Those storm clouds roll right on out of here. Could be God just teaching us a lesson. Storm clouds come for a season, but they're going to roll on out. 
It could be you've got a, a doctor's diagnosis. It's not, you, you don't know, you're in the unknowns, you're in the uncertainties, it's weighing on you. See the, see the physical through the spiritual. So when you walk into that doctor's office, man, you see the grace of God in giving us doctors who have studied and researched and done these surgeries and know these things. And that's, that's God just giving you confidence and assurance that I'm here. Look at the body of believers around you. You're going through a worry, you've got a stress, you've got a concern. Man, there's people in this room who have gone through the same exact things and they've made it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And you can walk with them and walk together and you can grow in your faith. A, ask the Lord to hear and answer your prayer. Jesus would say this over and over again. Ask, seek, knock. Listen, when you're facing a worry, you turn those worries into prayer requests. You ask the Lord what you want. Don't try to super spiritualize it. Man, you want God to heal? Ask him to heal. You want God to move? Ask him to move. He knows your heart anyway. So you ask God what you want. But at the end of the day, it's why. It's yield your will and your wants to the Lord's wills and wants. Because, listen, Heavenly Father knows best. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So we think this is the best route. We want this to be the best route. But at the end of the day, God, I trust you. You are my heavenly father that cares. And Jesus gave us a great example of this when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, God, Father, if there's any way this cup passes from me, if there's any way to do this, let it pass from me. And he said, nevertheless, not I will, but yours be done. If we want worry, which is unreasonable, unproductive, unhealthy, and unchristian to decrease and our faith to increase. There's one way to it. That is we pray. Jesus on anxiety. You can have it, but prayer is what helps us, helps it not have us. Amen? Thanks so much for watching. We pray you've been encouraged and challenged. At Champion Force, we focus on advancing the kingdom of God by making disciples, loving our community, and strengthening the church. We are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God and growing in their relationship with Him. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. To connect with us, just go to championforce.org connect. Of course, we can't wait to welcome you in person at one of our three locations in the near future. For campus-specific times and details, just visit our website at championforce.org. We'll see you very soon.